Robert Darnton was educated at Harvard University and Oxford University, where he was a Rhodes Scholar. After a brief stint as a reporter for the New York Times, he became a junior fellow in the Society of Fellows at Harvard. He began teaching in 1968 at Princeton, where he was the Shelby Cullum Davis 30 Professor of European History and directed the Center for the Study of Books and Media. Now I can intervene. In 2007, he came to Harvard as the Carl H. Fortzheimer University Professor and as the director of the Harvard University Library, where he continued for eight years and retired in 2015. So he is now Professor Emeritus and Librarian Emeritus of Harvard. Welcome to the Bibliophile. Well, thank you. You have said that book history, the history of the book, the study of it, is the most exciting field in the humanities. Why? Well, the, the excitement is palpable, so there is plenty of evidence of, of it. Um, when I first started doing research in what is now called book history, the term didn't yet exist. I mean, I began doing book history without knowing it. Mm -hmm. um, that was way back in 1965, and of course the discipline had begun with the publication of uh, the uh, L'Apparition du Livre yeah. by Lucien Fevre and Henri Jean Martin. So things were, had started already, but uh, they weren't really perceptible. Since then, we have had all kinds of publications, monographs, general histories of the book in France, in Britain, in Australia, in, uh, Canada, We've had uh, journals founded, devoted to the history of books. We've had conferences all the time. There are uh, special courses developed all over the place in the history of the book. There's a, an outpouring of interest and serious scholarship, as well as some public interest. So, uh, yes, <laughs> there's plenty of evidence that well, this is an exciting field. You've, you've described the excitement, but you haven't described why it's exciting. Well, that's a matter of interpretation, so I can only give you my own. I think that, uh, first of all, it's intriguing to try to understand the way books, especially printed books, but also medieval and ancient books, um, have become a power, how they actually are elements in historical change and not simply vehicles f for uh, of ideas. Mm. So it's interesting in itself, and it's especially interesting now when people go ar around saying, we live in an information society. I mean, oh, we do, but of course every society has been an information society, each mm. in its own way. Mm. So what book history does is to discover those different ways that information societies have functioned. And also, there Don't. are other elements, that, trying to answer your question. Yeah. Uh, I think that there has been in the world of literary studies an overselling of theory. Mm -hmm. um, now, some of the theory I sympathize with, and I'm not trying to put it down in general, but there was a sense of that tendency being played out and a kind of sense of being surfeited and, and even sick of literary theory among literary people. Well, the history of books had a great attraction to them because it was concrete. It could be theoretically informed, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it was a new area that was compatible with a lot of their interests, I think. So that's, that's another element, and there probably are plenty of others. You know, yeah. th disciplines wax and wane, and there are vogues in the study of the humanities and the social sciences. 
but I think book history is more than a vogue. It's now acquired a, uh, a profile and a presence as a discipline. What about the idea that because books are the agents of change, without them there wouldn't be the change? Maybe that's one of the reasons that it's so exciting, is that they sort of document how societies have evolved. Well, they certainly are agents of change, uh, but, you know, at some times more than at other times. So it's not as if they are uh, an element that has remained constant over mm -hmm. the centuries. Mm -hmm. Uh, they can, you know, be very effective and even crucial at certain periods, whereas at other periods they're not causing many ripples. Mm -hmm. So naturally book historians are attracted to moments of crises when they can show how the printed word, not just books, but all kinds yeah. of forms of print, has, has made a difference. One of the things that, that books are the printed word do is to uh, provide proof, for example, of let's say a treaty that was was put down in writing, and the proof that people lied, for example, or this group is due a certain reparation. Well, it depends on your notion of proof. So I like, I mean, I, of course, it's a good word. I, I like especially the word evidence. So books are evidence. Mm -hmm. uh, there are many other kinds of evidence. There are newspapers, for example. To what extent can one trust what one reads in newspapers? But if it's a treaty, that would prove that some, something was agreed to. Yes, and treaties are published. So treaties can be cited, and the citations can involve recourse to the actual wording of things. You know, treaties used to be published in a very curious way that people don't know about. In uh, 1748, after the Treaty of Aix-la-Chapelle, which ended the War of the Austrian Succession, the treaty was published, but the way it was published was through a parade in Paris in which you got a considerably large band with trumpets and drums and so on making a huge noise mm -hmm. and then a whole cavalcade of the household of the king and various important personages in Paris and in Versailles following. And this cavalcade would stop at various points in Paris and then a, um, a kind of public crier mounted on a horse would read the terms of the treaty at a high voice. Uh, this was publication. My point is that the concept of publication is to render public. Yeah. And to render something public can be done in many ways. So print is one of the many ways. And I think what you see in the case of the publishing of treaties is the coming together of oral communication with a lot of ceremony accompanying it and printed communication because then the treaty will be printed and it will be nailed up on some public place usually in the Place de Grève uh, before the Hôtel de Ville in Paris and the same thing is going on in Vienna and in London and uh, etc. Mm. So what you've got is again an information system in which print is one of many means of communication. What sets it apart, of course, as you imply, is that uh, it perdures. Uh, you've got print remaining as evidence in the archives, whereas oral communication disappears into the air. Yeah. One, one thing that fascinates me, though, is the way the two come together and the way the printed and oral communications mutually interact. Uh, I think that's an important aspect of book history, to embed it in other forms of communication and not to treat it as though it were in isolation. Hmm. Can you uh, rec recall an early uh, excitement that you had that the physical book provided you with? Uh, well, many. Uh, I've been... <laughs> I've been uh, astounded many times by things I found in books. 
including objects. Mm. You know, you see bits of hair and mm-hmm. sometimes uh, flower, flowers. Yes. No, I've never Do. found a condom. I haven't, but booksellers have told me. Yeah. yeah. One time, I wrote a long book, a, a publishing history of the great Encyclopédie of Diderot and d'Alembert. Mm-hmm. And that involved a lot of very precise research into the way it was printed. So I had the records of the foreman of the printing shop, and I could identify every printer who pulled the bar of the press for every sheet of this great book, which is the Bible of the Enlightenment. Well, I also looked through printed copies, and I found one in which a thumbprint was embedded in the actual binding. So this was not the thumbprint of some reader, it was the thumbprint of a printer before the book had been bound. I then went back to the manuscripts of the foreman of the booksellers uh, of, the, of the printing shop, and I found out the name of the man who had printed that particular sheet. On that and, day, I guess. Or... Well, I could identify the day yeah. and the, the sheet itself, uh, his name, and then there was a little bit of information about him. He was known from a nickname, Bon Man, or Good Man, Good Hand. Mm. He came from Normandy, he'd worked in some printing shops in Paris, then he went on a, he took to the road on a Tour de France, the way printers usually did. Uh, He got in trouble in Lyon, um, took up with uh, a couple and their daughter, walked with them to uh, Besançon, where they had a kind of fight with the head, the, the, the printer, the head master printer, and ran off again, showed up in this printing shop in Neuchâtel with a whole history behind him. Where uh, did you find all of that? Well, in the manuscripts of the Société Typographique de Neuchâtel, the only publisher, printer, bookseller, whose archives have remained almost intact since the 18th century. So there are nearly 50,000 letters of everyone who had to do with books, printers, paper makers, ink makers, smugglers, authors, of course, many booksellers, everyone. And uh, that's where I began work in 1965, uh, trying to recreate the whole world of books as it existed on the eve of the French Revolution at the height of the French Enlightenment. What about before 1965? Was there uh, anything in your early life that explains this love of books? Well, I I don't think I was terribly unusual. I love books, read books a lot, love was attracted to them, but I never set out to be a specialist in the study of books at all. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually set out to be a newspaper man uh, in the steps of my father, who was killed as a foreign correspondent in, in World War II. And so uh, from a very early age, I was writing things for newspapers, and uh, then I sort of did my apprenticeship in a crime sheet called the Newark Star Ledger when I was still in college. Uh, I went to Oxford, where I got my uh, PhD, a DPhil, but I worked for the London Bureau of the Times while I was a graduate student, and I was all set to have a career as a reporter. I went back, joined the Times, worked in the city room and in police headquarters, and finally I decided, no, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do history, but the history I did involved the study of American influences in France on the eve of the French Revolution. One of the key persons at that time was a guy called Jacques-Pierre Brissot, who would eventually become one of the leaders of the Girondist faction in the French Revolution. And I found a book which indicated that maybe there were papers of Brissot in this little city in Switzerland, Neuchâtel. So Mm. I followed up a footnote, wrote to the library there, do you, by any chance, have any letters of Brissot? They said, yes, uh, we have 119 letters, and here's a photograph, photocopy of one of them. Well, I read this photocopy. There I was, a, a, a student in 23 years old in Oxford, yeah. and it was enough to rethink the whole career of Brissot because he's corresponding with his Swiss publisher, 
about how to publish his books and how to get them in France, because any book that could not pass a censorship, of course, is printed outside of France. Uh, so after a few months, I left the New York Times. I got a postdoc at Harvard, and I immediately went to Neuchâtel, and there, sure enough, were the 119 unpublished letters by a major leader of the French Revolution. And other people knew about these. No. They didn't. No. You were the first to look at that footnote and take some action on it. Uh, yes, but I was in a way the second because the footnote was written by a local historian okay. who was talking about famous people who had visited Neuchâtel. He, and mm -hmm. so uh, he, he knew uh, that these letters existed. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, I went, the, I went to Neuchâtel and there were the letters, but they were part of this a gigantic archive 50,000 letters of other people who were book people in one way or another. I started writing a biography of Brissot, but, but then I dropped it because I thought the history of books is more important than the biography of Brissot, and that's how I became a book historian. So what explains this concentration of materials about books and publishing and booksellers? Why, why was that all there? Well, in France in the 18th century, um, there was a censorship of books, so everything before publication had to be approved by censors and uh, had to obtain a royal privilege, mm. something like a copyright. And that meant that anything that challenged the official values of the old regime had to be published outside France. Right. And uh, there was what I call a fertile crescent of publishing houses that grew up all around France, from Amsterdam and mm -hmm. The Hague uh, to Brussels and the Rhine uh, Valley and into Switzerland. And these books were all smuggled in? Yes. Smuggling was a major industry, um, highly organized. Uh, I've done a book about that, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and it worked Quite well, there were disasters, but there was a whole underground of, for the distribution of illegal books. Now, this underground worked because of economic as well as ideological conditions. So it turned out there was a trade war in the 17th century between Parisian publishers, the booksellers and printers guild of Paris on the one hand, mm. and provincial publishers, booksellers, and printers on the other. And the state intervened under Colbert himself and basically created a monopoly for the Parisians with the power to police the trade in their own interests and in the interest of the state. As a result, the provincial uh, publishers were wiped out, not totally, but almost, and they fell back on foreign suppliers who were their natural allies against the Parisians. Not only did these foreign suppliers provide them with the entire Enlightenment, which is published outside of France, with some exceptions, uh, and with all kinds of very interesting prohibited books that I've studied, you know, attacks on the Queen and that kind of thing, but pirated books. So every book that's published in France that has any success is instantly reprinted in this fertile crescent of publishing houses. And they can undersell the original French publisher by a huge margin because paper is cheaper, they don't have to pay for the manuscript, uh, laboring is, labor is even cheaper, especially in Switzerland. So this alliance between provincial booksellers and foreign publishers was a, a tremendous power in the world of books. Mm. And in my opinion, but I, I can prove <coughs> it, I think, mm -hmm. uh, it's a subject of my last book, it hasn't been published yet. Um, in my opinion, uh, more than half the books that circulated on the market in France on the eve of the revolution were pirated. I mean, that, uh, what I'm claiming is that piracy was a, a fundamental uh, aspect of the publishing industry and the book trade on the eve of the French Revolution. Well, so a disregard of copyright. 
Yes, and of course copyright existed only in Britain after the Statute of Anne in 1710. Yeah. Uh, probably it existed in Denmark in 1741. That's not altogether clear, but basically on the continent, <clears throat> mm. there is no copyright and there's certainly no international copyright. So why do you call it pirating then? Well, because there was something called privilege. Okay. Uh, and that's, it's, it's an early, if you like, version of, of copyright, but it belongs to a different conceptual universe. Mm. A privilege is given by the king or the sovereign, wherever it is, out of the grace of the king. It's not property. And this is made explicit in all kinds of edicts of the crown. In, notably in uh, an edict of August 30th, 1777, where the crown makes it very clear. A privilege is not a kind of property. It's a grace accorded by the king. Now, mm. how do you get that grace? Mm. Well, your manuscript has to be approved by a censor, mm. and then uh, it has to be registered in the Guild of Paris, and so on and so on. Uh, so you t it functions as a kind of property. And mm -hmm. there's a whole debate about this. But according to the Crown, it's not really property. Still, if anyone reprints a book for which you have a privilege, you can accuse that person of piracy. And how severe would the punishment? Well, if the, uh, so to speak, criminal was a subject of the King of France, because you have pirates operating in Lyon and Rouen and a few other cities, mm then that person could be hauled off to the Bastille and kept there, usually for three or four months, but enough to really hurt its business. Mm. The pirated copies could be confiscated and turned over to the original owner of the privilege, and you could be fined. So there were serious punishments, but you know, no torture, no, no one is hanged or anything like that. So... Do you think that this, this resentment from the provinces, which was directed toward the monarchy, contributed to the uprising? Yes, although uh, that's a little simple. Yeah. So <laughs> the resentment is aimed at the Parisians mm. primarily. They're mm. a guild with a monopoly who... Uh, dominate the book trade uh, to they're the favored detriment. They're favored by the, the king, and, of But they're favored by the king, by the state, uh, by uh, more than a century of royal edicts. Mm. There were about 3,000 royal edicts concerning the book trade in the 18th century, mm. 17th and 18th century. I mean, it's a big deal. It's a major yeah. industry. Well, when and, you think of it, there wasn't any television or radio. This was, this was yes. it. That's yeah. right. So books yeah. really mattered. Yeah. Now, you know, you can't, draw a linear uh, account of causality no. that goes from the sale of a book to the reading of a book to the development of the attitude on the part of the reader to the development of collective attitudes mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. to action intervention uh, on July 14, 1789. It's not as simple as that. But, but the pirates were all... Outside of France well, are not happy. French. Yeah, they're probably pretty happy. They're delighted. Yeah. And, and many of them... We use the word pirate, and mm. the word was used in the 18th century, mm -hmm. but they were businessmen, and they were often pillars of society in mm. various cities outside of France. So what they're doing is, in their eyes, legitimate business, and a good thing, too. Yeah. So I've done a study of, of uh, especially this one firm in Neuchâtel, but there, there are hundreds, even thousands, of letters by other publishers, mm -hmm. which give a good account of the kind of business they ran and who they were, etc. And they're all in it for money, basically. I mean, mm -hmm. they, some of them favored Enlightenment ideas and others didn't. You know, they each had their own opinions. Mm -hmm. But what drove the industry was the desire for gain. And they're very explicit about this in their letters. Mm -hmm. So the book you know, I, you look at the book as an yeah. object that mm. is a commercial object yeah. that is doing very well, thank you, mm. with ups and downs, but that also carries messages, of course. And I think it's important to not simply read texts for 
their ideological import, but to understand how they functioned as items of commercial exchange. Well, and also the suppression of them, or the, the spread of them, as you said earlier on, that it's a, it's a way that society does or doesn't change, or... Yes, of course, uh, and there are uh, scandals and incidents and famous episodes mm. that touched off debates and ignited public opinion. Um, for example, the great Encyclopédie, which I mentioned, uh, the, in a way the book that, as I said, is called the Bible of the Enlightenment, was declared illegal and banned and prohibited and so on by not just the king and the king's council, but by the Parliament of Paris, by the Pope, by bishops. I mean, everyone uh, took a turn in attacking this book for its wickedness, its uh, unchristian, anti-clerical messages, mm. uh, and uh, many aspects of it. And, it would, but it originally a... had a privilege. And the fact that such a book could be published with a privilege yeah. was deeply shocking to a lot of French. And so there was, there was a lot of ink spilt, and a, it was a scandal. Mm. And there were many other scandals, which I could cite. The scandal over De l'Esprit, a book by Avesius, which was essentially atheistic, and that had had a royal privilege through a series of mistakes and mishaps. And that caused a huge scandal. And then there were books that uh, never had privileges, but that in themselves caused a scandal. Mm. A, lot about, a lot of what you're talking about is this government control of information. Sure. And, <clears throat> you know, the French government was rather sophisticated. Uh, the police of Paris was considered the most modern and advanced police force in the world. And uh, it had been really created in 1667. It had a whole history behind it. But it had not only centers, sort of head, various headquarters in the parts of Paris, but they, it also had specialized inspectors. And one of them was an inspector of literature. His title was Inspecteur de la Librairie, or of the book trade. Uh, the most famous of these inspectors was a guy called Joseph Desmery, and he went about the study of booksellers, printers, and authors systematically. He did a census of writers between 1748 and 1752, and he came up with 500 dossiers, 500, which include Voltaire, Montesquieu, Diderot, uh, Rousseau, uh, and then hundreds of writers about whom no one's ever heard. What, so, monitoring what they're uh, saying? He didn't give his reasons. So you have to induce his reasons. But in my opinion, I've published them all on a website that I've put up. He was a serious professional, and he wanted to understand his area of responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, and so he went about it in a systematic way. Mm -hmm. He knew every bookseller, every printer in Paris, and he knew a huge number, personally knew personally, a huge yeah. number of writers. He also had tastes in writing. In one of his reports, it's about a writer, he says, this guy can't, he, he writes prose okay, but he can't manage decent verse in Alexandrians. <laughs> so this is a... So he's this, a literary critic as well. <laughs> so to speak. That's how sophisticated the police were in the 18th century. But what was his role? Well, his role is to enforce the edicts on the book trade, to survey, to police... Uh, all of the booksellers and printers in Paris, so he will regularly call on them, inspect their shops. To make sure what? They're selling the right stuff? To make sure they're not selling anything forbidden. Right. Yes. Right. And pirated. Hmm. So uh, the state recognizes that books matter. Hmm. The state understands imperfectly the power of the printed word. And it uses its uh, 
institutions, including the police, uh, to try to survey, inspect, and control this new force, which is uh, crucial in an early modern society. And you were a pioneer in this field. Well, I don't want to call myself a pioneer, but yes, I'm I'm one of the first. Well, no persons. one else was studying this, and yet it was such a such an important aspect of society. Yes, that's right. Now, uh, literary scholars and historians have always known that the Enlightenment mattered, and they cite you know the most famous Enlightenment works. But in my view, we need to understand the entirety mm. of French literature. We need to know what the French actually. Uh, were reading yeah, and yeah. what and what was influencing the the authors that we all know about. That's right. So, yeah. what was literary demand, so to speak? Mm. And by studying these archives, I think I can answer that question. I mm. I even have a so to speak retrospective bestseller list, and know which books were most ordered, and I would add most read and by can, French can you people. Access? You can access these books somewhere. Sure. Oh yeah. Yeah, I mean, they're bestsellers. I have a little collection there. You see, they're all 18th century books. They include some forbidden bestsellers from, that were persecuted by the police at this time. They were such, such bestsellers that they were um, reprinted all over the place, and you find them in libraries today and in second-hand bookshops. So they're not rare. Uh, so if you take a book like yeah, that, it's, it's the main, it's the highlights that are the high points that are expensive and yes, it, it, this is the but, but, but what you want to collect them all? No, I'm not a big collector, um, but I got fascinated by the forbidden bestsellers. In fact, that's the title of one of my works, the Forbidden Bestsellers of Pre-Revolutionary France, and. Um, the uh, there you know you find them all over the place in mm -hmm. in, in antiquarian bookshops. It's not difficult to mm -hmm. find. Mm -hmm. I not I don't have a lot of money, but I can afford the Private Life of Louis Fifteen, and it's a great read. Mm -hmm. It's a terrific book. You know, four volumes, which it amounts to a whole history of the reign mm -hmm. of, of France between seventeen fifteen and seventeen seventy four. There's a lot of sex in it. Sorry, are there sex in it. Lots of sex. Yeah. <laughs> so the sex life of the king is a major theme, but it's mixed up with uh, political uh, rivalries mm -hmm. and well, politics in general, because mm -hmm. this is a time in which politics are court politics. Mm -hmm. But it, but <clears throat> the court isn't isolated. So all kinds of riots in Paris, bread riots, and other things uh, also influence the closed world of court politics. So if, if you read a work like uh, The Private Life of Louis XV, you get there's lots of frisson, you know, because of the scandal, mm. but there is a, a, a vivid view and portrayal of political history and more than political history. Um, so I think that these, uh, for, and I can prove, I believe, that this book was a bestseller. Mm. Now, uh, so, and, and therefore, common knowledge. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, how common, and mm -hmm. who were the readers? How did they do the reading? And there are lots of open questions. Yeah, I, But was... this is a start to, to, to demonstrate a, an enormous demand for the private life of Louis XV, but the secret anecdotes of Madame du Barry, uh, I mean, I could go on and on. And I'm not trying to reduce all literature to these, but when I first came across this, this became a major theme in my publications. And people reacted by saying, well, this is, this is amazing and surprising, we didn't know this. But then they said, but maybe you're overstating your case. And so there's been criticism of my interpretation. And I think some of the criticism is valid so in my last work, I've tried to reconstruct the entire corpus of what people read and to situate the forbidden literature within it to mm. see how important it was in relation to the rest. Mm. Uh, so new possibilities of re research and new questions keep turning up. But beyond, beyond you, you may not be interested, especially in pre-revolutionary France, but... That was my next question, is why France? Why not the United States? 
Is it more? Is it way more interesting? And in, you know, is the book history way more interesting in France? I think it's interesting everywhere. Yeah. And but you know, France has obviously captured you. It captured me, but you know, there are lots of <laughs> other book historians. Yeah. David Hall, for example, mm. is a wonderful. A book historian who's devoted himself to the study of colonial America, mm. and uh, he is one of the uh, d- d- editor directors of the history of the book in America. Yeah, it's a terrific field, mm-hmm. and I've now met Chinese uh, book historians. They've got a lot to say. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think that book history is a kind of thing that can be studied in any context. Mm. What you need, though, is adequate documentation. So what hooked me was the richness of these archives in this little Swiss city at Neuchâtel. Mm. But that doesn't mean that you, uh, you know, this is the only subject. It's just something that I found endlessly interesting and have studied since 1965. So that's a lot more than 50 years I've been at it. Yeah, and it still holds your attention and fascination. Yeah, I mean, I've done other things along the way, but uh, this has been one of my central concerns. And I've now, I think, uh, pretty much completed what I had to say about the Swiss archives, using also archives in Paris and other parts of France Mm -hmm. uh, as uh, supplementary or complementary material. So, you know, what I'm trying to say just by describing my own work is that book history is enormously uh, interesting. And if you get deep into it, as in the case of these archives, you get to know booksellers. Mm. They, uh, I mean, if you've read 200 letters of a bookseller in Besançon, and he, you find out, you know, he, or, or just any city, he, maybe he's a very poor person, a, someone from the lower ranks, and he manages to woo and win uh, a young woman with a dowry. And they together set up a tiny little bookshop uh, to supplement the income, which is miserable at first. He does some binding and maybe peddling or even smuggling. And then things are going pretty well. They expand, but then sometimes they order more books than they can sell and they have a crisis in their finances. And then a baby comes along. And, uh, you know, you can... Where, Where do you get all of this from? From these archives I talked about, so I get but, to know them. But uh, they're did they're let they they're letters to not just their customers then. No, these are letters to their supplier, who is a printer and wholesale book dealer. And so, he talks about his life to to. Yeah, it d- depends on the person. Mm. Some talk in more personal <laughs> terms than others, yeah. but frequently they can't pay their bills, mm-hmm. and they explain why. Well, my mm. wife's pregnant, and uh, yeah, uh, etc. So yeah. there is a kind of human drama that runs through all of this. Mm. In my view, it's Balzac. It's pure yeah. Balzac. Yeah. The his his great novel, The Lost Illusion, Illusion Perdue, mm. mm-hmm. is he describes the world, this world in the eighteen twenties. Printers, it's, yeah. It's very close to the world I'm studying in the seventeen. 70s, 1780s. Mm. Uh, so you, you make contact with, with human beings who had disappeared in history, mm. and you can do history at a, at, at a depth that isn't usually possible. It's very exciting. Just because this particular trade is that much better, what, documented, preserved than, than others? In this case, yes. But, mm. you know, historians working in other fields have fallen upon by chance in the archives, mm. marvelous things. So uh, archival research is like that. You mm. know, sometimes you come across something and you run with it. Other times it's just uh, you know kind of ordinary uh, and not terribly interesting documents one after the other. I love this definition of the research that uh, book historians undertake, and it includes composition, mediation, reception, survival, and transformation. I wonder if we could look at each one of those. Composition, for example, that is just the, the, the simple writing of how a manuscript may have been written. 
and where it came from. Well, when, when I hear composition, I tend to think of com- compositors working in printing yeah. shops. That's more mediation, <laughs> isn't it? <coughs> well, I mean, this is the actual production of the physical thing, the book. Yes, so, but it's, you have to have the manuscript before yes, you do sure. the, right. composi- the compositor gets to work. Right. Well, I, I wrote a, a piece many years ago called What is the History of Books? In it, I uh, produced a diagram, which I call a communication circuit. And that's the argument. You need to study every stage in the development of a book, mm. from the writing of the manuscript to the setting of the type and the pulling of the bar of the press and its distribution and so on, to its sales and... And the reception of the, and the, reception. From the reader. That's yeah. right, which in turn has an influence on the author in the, as he goes to his next book. Right. So there is feedback, in other words, for the author. Mm. And my basic point was that I thought at that stage, I, I can't remember when it was, but quite a few years ago, there was a lot of wonderful work on these separate aspects of the production and distribution of books, but they weren't integrated. So there were specialists who could tell you all about paper and how paper is made and, you know, look at watermarks, and et cetera. It's a fascinating and highly technical, mm-hmm. highly interesting mm-hmm. aspect of scholarship. But those people didn't necessarily have anything to do with people who were studying the actual book trade and the way books were transported and tariffs on them and Mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So how the paper was used. Yes. So in my view, the book historian should try to integrate all of these aspects in the production and distribution and even, if I may use the word, consumption of books. Mm -hmm. Uh, And uh, so the idea is to do a total history of books, not simply a highly specialized one that won't... um, get beyond a, a very restricted domain. Mm-hmm. What um, are you most proud of having achieved? Well, pride goeth before a fall. So, <laughs> I've, I've so you're not tr- proud of anything? Uh, well, I try to avoid <laughs> pride. Uh, my wife is very good at uh, reminding me not to take myself too seriously. Mm. Um, so if I could avoid the word, I could say one thing that has given me a sense of satisfaction is having readers. Mm. So I've just got back from China, as I mentioned to you. Uh, it turns out I have eight books in Chinese and two more on the way. And they've gone through many editions, some, some of them. In fact, when I was there, one of the uh, a Chinese uh, student showed me a pirated edition of one of these books. <laughs> right. And I get letters from China, from readers. That gives you satisfaction. To know that uh, having sweated it out in the archives and in the writing of mm. a book, mm-hmm. that the book actually does have readers and that you can have some influence on the way other people are doing their work and uh, that some back and forth. Mm-hmm. So... It's uh, it's very uh, satisfying to do this kind of research and find that it takes. Now, it doesn't take in the general public necessarily. Mm. I've only written really one book that was a minor bestseller and that had and still does have readers all over. Which but, one's that? Uh, that's a book called The Great Cat Massacre. Mm. Mm-hmm. Now, it's not about no. book history. But it, it it is an attempt to do a kind of history, which I could call anthropological history, mm. uh, that um, has a good deal of appeal. And I think it can be written up in a way that would make its appeal take on the part of a general educated readership. Uh, and so that's fun, too, because it's, as I say, it's been through many, many editions and is widely assigned and widely read and... That makes me feel good. So it's good to have readers, but you don't always. And I sometimes work real hard on on some book that didn't make a splash at all. You know, it's like mm. dropping a, a stone into a well and you wait to hear the splash. You wait and wait. Then there is no splash sometimes. <laughs> so uh, I don't have any illusion that I'm um, 
you know, reaching a mass readership or whatever. Yeah. But I, I think that my writing has reached uh, a certain number of people and has been useful to them. One of your ambitions is uh, to make readers laugh out loud. Yes, I, uh, I wrote that someplace. Now, I don't know if they've laughed out loud. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, I, I believe in rigorous history in which anything you assert can be uh, verified by evidence. So lots of footnotes to manuscript sources, etc. And that kind of rigor can be pretty, well, it could be boring. Anyhow, it's not something that necessarily will make readers laugh. But I think in the discussion, for example, of the private life of Louis XV, mm. there are some laughs to be had. I'd, I would like to amuse readers, not play to their worst instincts, but to entertain them. I think history can be entertaining, too. And so uh, how do you do that? What's your approach to it? I don't think I have an approach, no. actually. I fall upon something sometimes in the archives that I find humorous, and then I try to write it in a way that does not distort the evidence, but that gets across the humor. Uh, I did a book on street songs and poems that were recited in Paris in the, uh, in the middle of the 18th century, and some of them are very funny. They just are funny, and uh, I think the humor can still be appreciated you know, 250 years later, uh, even by non-readers of French. I mean, it takes some explanation and, yeah. uh, and so on. Yeah. But there was a particular song that <clears throat> caused the collapse of the government in 1749. And if you get, you read the text of it, it's only four lines. It's one. You as a modern American might say, uh, what's so funny about this and so horrifying about this? Mm. But then, you know, if you do enough exegesis, it turns out it's very shocking. And basically the author of the song says um, that the, the king's uh, mistress, uh, Madame de Pompadour, has given the king VD. <laughs> but it's all done with plays on words and mm. so on. Mm -hmm. And that's, see, you just laughed. Yeah. So it is funny. Mm -hmm. um, and the author, it, it was attributed to the head of the government, the Comte de Maurepas, who was promptly fired and exiled. No, oh, this is an example of wit that's, first of all, oral, then mm -hmm. it's copied out and Good. circulated in manuscript, and then the manuscript versions are printed. So it really travels around. That wasn't perceived as being uh, an attack on the on the king to, to to make light of this. Then was it? Well, how was it perceived? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question, but mm -hmm. it's an empirical question. And so naturally, I read as many private journals and and correspondence as mm -hmm. I could find, because none of this could be discussed publicly in newspapers or anything like that. And I think that. People laughed, it, laughed at it, but mm. viewed it as an example of the kind of internal warfare that went, all, went on among factions in the court. And in this case, one particular faction was getting the upper hand of another faction. Th that the humor and the, the, the kind of dirty joke, because it was a dirty joke, mm. uh, is part of that struggle. What would you like to be remembered for? Well, I think it's up to... Uh, posterity to make to answer that question they can if I'm remembered at all they might want to remember me as uh, someone who was deep in the trenches trying to work in the early stages of the history of books they might uh, they might conceivably think of me as someone who was very committed to an ethnographic view of the study of the past anthropological history I don't know they might conceivably have some interest in my attempts to create the Digital Public Library of America and open access in the world of books today. Um, and my role in the, here at the Library of Harvard, which is a great library. I have also, uh, I've been a trustee of the, of the New York Public Library and 
very uh, committed to libraries in general. So, you know, I, I, I don't want to sound, again, as if I'm proud of all of this, but this yeah. is what I've been, what has occupied me over mm -hmm. the last years. And uh, if what is go if going to be remembered about it, uh, I don't know. As I say, it's up to posterity to select if posterity wants to pay any attention at all. But who knows? There, mm -hmm. There's a lot going on in the world today. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that my life, after I've lived it, is going to <laughs> loom as crucial to uh, people dealing with maybe a nuclear disaster or climate change. Where do you hope that the study of the book will go? I, I hope it will go well outside the Western world mm -hmm. and deeper into societies in both the Western world and the non-Western world. Uh, so there are dimensions, I think, that remain to be explored. And I think it's important to try to relate it to other means of communication and not to isolate books, but to understand how they uh, were situated within a whole environment that was a kind of ecology of information. And then, of course, one area that really interests people now is reading, the history of reading and yeah. how that's done. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult because we, you, you can come up with wonderful examples and case studies, but to try to characterize a whole reading publics is more difficult. Uh, still, I think a lot of progress is being made in that respect as well. Is there any major idea or discovery that you come up with that sticks with you? A discovery that I myself made? Yeah, in, this, in your lifetime of study. Well, uh, for me... It's about the, yourself the, and about the field. Uh, well, uh, if, if I talked about the field in general, there have been many wonderful moments. And one moment that that moved many of us was Carlo Ginsberg's uh, The Cheese and the Worms, in which he discovered that a, a miller, a very modest person in 16th century Friulia, uh, was reading books and reading them with a, in a very original way, a way that made it possible to see his whole worldview. Um, I think that Carlo's uh, ability to evoke this and to do real rigorous research at the same time was a wonderful thing. So there are moments like that in which you get very uh, inspired. And I am I feel very close to Roger Chartier, who as a book historian has shown lots of fascinating things. Roger is now particularly interested in the, in the fluidity of texts and how they change as they move from edition to edition and language to language. Um, and he sees relations between Cervantes, who is his favorite in a way, and Shakespeare. Things well, they were you... born and died on the same days, weren't they? Yeah, they're part of the, that, the same world. Mm -hmm. And uh, Roger, uh, I think, has very good evidence that Shakespeare knew about Don Quixote and in a way used, at least was inspired by some of that, the aspects of that other great, uh, great work. So I've, I love following his study, too, which is very different from mine. I've remained much more down-to-earth and uh, deep in the archives. And he's now developed a, a dimension of almost literary criticism that mm. I think is quite wonderful. Mm. Um, so there are many, you know, many examples of, the, of this kind of thing. But just uh, finally, do you have a favorite book, both from a content perspective and an object perspective. Well, of course, I, there are many books that I love dearly, but this may sound provocative. But I, let me put it this way. My favorite book is Mother Goose. I love... Particular edition, or doesn't matter? Uh, there is a, a fairly standard edition, which has a checkered cover and a picture of uh, an old woman riding on a goose. And it's the most widely used a version of the uh, Mother Goose Rhymes in English, uh, certainly in the United States. But of course, I've read many historical accounts of Mother Goose as well. But I have uh, three children and seven grandchildren, and I have 
the inflicted mother goose on them <laughs> forever. So uh, nothing for me is, uh, is happier than pulling this volume down. And often I just ask them to open it at any page and then they look at the pictures and they choose one and I read it to them. Or we have a contest. Can, have they memorized the words uh, as well as I have or better than I have? And the, the, the rhymes are endlessly evocative and um, fascinating, but they, for me, also evoke time spent co-reading with yeah. my children and grandchildren. Mm -hmm. so that's why Mother Goose has become my favorite book. And isn't that why so many people love books? It's because it takes them back to warm, emotional, loving times. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. So, yes, thank yeah, you. Yeah, I've got thank to get you. back yes. to some writing. Yes, okay, thank you so much for taking the time to answer my questions. Not at all. Thank, okay. thank you for your questions. Okay. Very good questions. Very good.